Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this workshop. We will be waiting a, only a few minutes more for some more people to shine. Um, but uh, in two minutes, we will be starting with the uh, presentation of uh, Ma Marianela, Umut, and Sofia. And then we will have a workshop session with them to think about feminist AI and critical perspective of, of AI. So we will wait just one minute and we will start. Well, hi everyone, welcome. As I was saying uh, a few minutes uh, earlier, we will have two parts of this workshop. The first one will be for you to meet our amazing guests, uh, Umut, Marianela, and Sofia. Uh, they will speak a little bit about what they are thinking and doing in their uh, academic and work life and activist life regarding uh, AI, feminism, and critical perspectives. And after that, we will have a session, a workshop, workshop ses session to work with them to think about these issues. So we will have the first half an hour of presentations and the second half an hour of work in uh, breakout rooms. So uh, Umut, if you want to start your presentation, that would be great. Thank you for being here. Well, uh, hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. Uh, well, uh, my name is Umut Pajaro Velasquez. Um, I go by the pronouns they and them. And a non-binary person, um, and I also uh, I consider myself a queer activist, and probably I try to miss um, pretty much everything that I do, some queer theory in 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 the midst. Yeah. Uh, well, right now I'm uh, I'm working as the head of the gender standing group in internet society, but also uh, I'm doing research related to queer, uh, queer rights and artificial intelligence. And how I'm doing that? Well, uh, I had this idea of creating a kind of queer epistemology for the, uh, for the artificial intelligence. Uh, this queer epistemology for me must include uh, some new perspectives about the the way we see data and how we conform uh, how well, how we uh, conform com yeah how we conform or data or data sets in the protected attributes so. I always, uh, in this part, I always say that we need to start to, to see how these queer perspectives are going beyond the global north, especially, in the, especially how we see gender in the global south, because it, it's going to give us a better uh, understanding of, the, of that category in general. Uh, and we have, and we're going to have better technologies in the in various technologies related to artificial intelligence that include gender uh, by default and uh, gender diversity by default. That's probably one of the uh, that's my main goal. Uh, but in order to achieve that, we have uh, to we had to aim to different. Uh, multi stakeholder at the same time. We need technical people, we need academia, we need uh, 
policy <laughs> policy makers and we need civil society so we need everyone that can be involved in this because the way that we need to address uh, the understanding of gender especially in the global south when we have a lot of cultures that understand gender beyond the binary so it's, it's necessary to improve those data sets and, 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 and embed embedded in the design, development, deployment of the artificial intelligence. That's pretty much my proposal related to artificial intelligence and queer theory right now. I'm working on that, giving some like uh, ideas or giving or trying to write something related to that right now. Uh, it's it's and and also is actually my proposal for my doctorate. So I'm I'm hoping that actually can make it happen <laughs> because it, it's not easy, it, beyond we seeing this there is an important conversation for everyone because artificial intelligence is one of the most rapidly uh, fields in technology uh, that is growing in technology right now. Actually, it's not a thing that is. Uh, the, it's not a conversation that we're having. I will leave the, leaving a lot of people uh, outside of the conversation, especially voices from the global south, where the technology actually affects more people, and where the visions about gender are more uh, outside from the binary than actually in dying in the global north, because uh, um, uh, because we came for a different we. For example, in most of the global South countries, uh, we are a mix of different cultures and the mix of different cultures give us a different perspective of the, of the life. And um, well, that will be pretty much uh, what I had to say. <laughs> Thank you, Omo. That's really interesting. And uh, that's the whole purpose of this workshop is to bring the voices of the global South and from Latin America to this conversation that it's usually uh, only in, in the North sometimes. Uh, it's starting to be here and we're starting to get together and to discuss all of this. So that's why I created this uh, document. So everyone that wants to, no one is forced to do this, uh, can put what they are doing, their names and their contacts so we can keep in touch and we can continue the conversation after the workshop. So thank you, Umut, uh, for your presentation. We will uh, pass the uh, mic to Sofia, if you are there. Oh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm sorry, I prepared something for 10 minutes, so it will look like I will take a lot of space. So I apologize for that now. But no, don't I worry. Decided, I, I decided to to first talk a bit about how I got to the point that, where I am at, at the present working on AI, uh, and then talk a, a tiny bit about the work I've been doing. So, so first for me, it's important to say that I'm Mexican. I was born and raised in Mexico City, and I, I was an undergraduate in mathematics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And afterwards, I, I studied a PhD as, again in maths at the University of Warwick in the UK. And I spent around 10 years working in pure mathematics, but I never felt comfortable in the field. And in retrospective, I, I see now that many of the issues that I was experiencing were gender issues. Uh, it's important to highlight that mathematics is a very heavily male-dominated field. And so some of the issues is like, for example, even though our work was considered relevant in the field, uh, for example, only my male colleagues who were invited to give conferences or to speak at seminars about this work. So uh, a lot of the questions when I did get invited that I got asked afterwards were not work related. People were just wanting to hit on you or to talk to you about non-work related things. So I generally didn't feel like I was treated like a colleague or like a peer uh, for most of the time. So that was very problematic for me. And as well, uh, in relation to the Global South, so my PhD was funded by the Mexican government. And when I got to the UK, I realized how difficult it is for people from the Global South to have access to, to study abroad. 
particularly when the grants come from their own governments. So for me, producing work where that was going to be read only by five people because theoretical maths is super specific at that point. So it started to be a heavyweight on me. So I started to uh, want to work on more social issues and to try to produce work which will have a positive impact, not only on Latin America, but particularly in Mexico. So <laughs> needless to say that like, after all of that time, I was heavily depressed. I just like didn't find myself uh, at the work what I was doing. I wasn't happy. And I would like to say that I, for me, like uh, mental health issues, I, I think it's great that we talk about it now, but within academia, I think they're very normalized. And it was very difficult for me to even <laughs> acknowledge that and to take the time to decide to change. So finally, after a really long time, I tell you, like almost a decade, I decided to quit mathematics and have like a full on crisis. I traveled the world for about a year <laughs> and didn't want to know anything about anything anymore. And then I came back to Mexico and I started to think what I could do with my new life or search a new career. So uh, I, I was like, I'm a mathematician, so perhaps I can learn programming and the most hype thing to do if you want to learn programming uh, was AI. So I started like researching AI. I, I immediately became interested in the part that was related to AI ethics. But when I started working on it, I realized that for first, like one of the most interesting papers that I came across were related to gender and race and in natural language processing. For me, those were groundbreaking. Like I really like that work. <laughs> but most of the solutions that were provided back then uh, were based on technical aspects of like doing projections or how to do design the metrics or whatever, but the solutions didn't seem to really address the issues. And I didn't see this as a way of solving any of the problems that we were seeing with the systems. So I started to think maybe the problems are more related to the context and they couldn't be understood with the metrics that were being used uh, in AI. So I started to focus on understanding the politics, the culture, the narratives, and especially the materiality of AI. It's something that I really find that it's very interesting. So, uh, and then obviously you realize that most of these proposals or most of the visions of the work on AI uh, comes from the perspective of the global North and aligns with their visions, with their needs and with their aspirations. So uh, for me, it was groundbreaking to start reading uh, particularly black feminism, in terms of standpoint theory, intersectionality, uh, bodies, territories, everything. Uh, and something else that was very important for me, and <laughs> I uh, I think it really changed my view is, uh, I'm sharing this now. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen? Uh, it's kind of uh, cut. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll... Oh, no, I'll... It's, it's, it's perfect now. Yeah, sorry. I have to make it bigger, but now I'm very I'm nervous. No, I, I think it's it's pretty great. Don't worry. Yeah, can you see it? Okay. Yeah. I just feel like I have like a million tabs open for some mysterious reason. But so for me, something that was very important was to come across with uh, epistemologies from the global south. And I really like this definition that is given by Sosa Santos, which is that uh, so even though the, the global south is generally people who are living in the Southern Hemisphere. I like to think about uh, the Global South as a metaphor for human suffering caused by capitalism, colonialism at a global level, and as well as the resistance to overcoming or minimizing such suffering. So in this case, then it means that the anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, anti-patriarchal, anti-imperialist South. So all those other visions that are aligned with this. <laughs> So, and I think this uh, brings uh, the global south even to the global north. So there is south everywhere, no? So in the form of immigrants, in the form of like people who are marginalized, etc. So I started to think of epistemologies of the global south, not as this, uh, or the global south, not as this place that is like behind and is lacking things and has a lot of issues that need solving but as a way of thinking about different ways of being or living and understanding the world and to try to think if those other visions of the world could help us change AI or could change uh, the way that we're doing things. So I'll tell you a tiny bit about the projects that I've been doing, just some of them. So some of the first work I did, uh, it was uh, in relation to how to implement ethics committees for AI. So this work uh, is, it, it, it thinks about AI ethics from the point of view of human rights, but what 
what we wanted to do is to think about how so bioethics is something that is already established and they have committees to oversee research and projects so we were thinking well perhaps universities could use bioethics as a model in order to produce work or like to uh to make committees to uh to oversee AI. So, and something that I really like about bioethics comparison to other AI ethics proposals are, for example, some of the central principles are autonomy, beneficence, and non manifestance So it's generally to maximize benefit for people, to minimize risks and to minimize harms and to preserve autonomy. And I think all of these are very big issues uh, in the field of AI. And I don't think they're being fully addressed with the principles uh, that we're using most of the time. Depends on who produces the principles. <laughs> and some of the other work that I did uh, was this one, which is, uh, it was a project uh, from a report for the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. So on this work, what I uh, what we did was to mainly analyze the, the narratives around like the he hegemonic narratives around technology and particularly around the digital divide. And what we did in order to analyze these narratives is to analyze how Facebook has expanded in different countries in the global south, so in Mexico, Myanmar, and India. And uh, very interestingly, to start looking at the relationships between the governments and the corporations and how they are working in tandem. <laughs> and uh, so in order to do this work, I think it was important to highlight the importance of taking into consideration the context of the different places. Like even though it's the same technology that we studied, which was mainly Facebook free basics, uh, the difference in the context and how it happened, like the development of this technology in each place is different. So I work on the part of Mexico and mainly I studied how free basics uh, developed here and I'm uh, like well that's interesting but the, what I really wanted to do in this work is actually to start thinking about uh, the global south as a way to propose way of doing uh, a way to do, th do things differently so in this work I highlighted the importance of the social uh, uh, I don't know, projects that we have in order to guarantee the right to communication and how to think about those projects in terms of social benefits and not in terms of commercial benefits. So in Mexico, we have uh, many telecommunication projects, which are like telecommunication networks, intranets, et cetera, which are run, owned and operated uh, by indigenous people and by rural communities. So I think these are examples of how to can produce technology that is not aligned with capitalism, with extractivism and with exploitation of practices. And instead of that, they are working on projects that are aligned with self-determination, with autonomy and with solidarity. So I think these are already good examples of how to do that. And the oh, last one, yeah. yeah. One minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the last one is this uh, project that I'm working on with uh, the Feminist Research Network, which is uh, we're trying to explore if it's possible to use AI to help indigenous language interpreters. So this, these interpreters are key for indigenous people to have access to justice in Mexico. And we're trying to see if AI could be done in a way that is collaborative, cooperative, and non-exploitational. And we are gonna try to use uh, indigenous data sovereignty, which is a movement that exists in many other regions in the world uh, to try to design this project. And I will say that's it, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sofia. That's so interesting. Uh, I love the, the framework where you uh, the Sosa Santos uh, piece, and uh, it's a, a lot of people said it in, in the chat too. Um, now we are going to have our final uh, short presentation from Marianela, and then we will. Uh, I will tell you how the, this uh, mini workshop is going to go. I fear that we won't have enough time because I'm uh, reading all the amazing presentations that you are. Uh, writing in the document and everyone has a lot to say about this uh, topic as it, uh, so it's going to be really interesting to be in the breakout rooms and share everything uh so my uh you have the floor now 
Thank you, Edith, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. Mine is also uh, 10 minutes, like Sophia's. Um, so my relationship to AI is actually rather recent, so I wanted to give you a bit of a back backstory about my journey so that you can understand a bit my perspectives and the angles that I take, and also hopefully to, to help showing that um, the people that work with AI are not just male engineers or developers from the global north that only care about algorithms and models, and instead Instead, that there are many other possi possible paths and identities, also like Umut and Sophia have uh, showed uh, to us today. Um, so about me, so I'm a Latin American feminist researcher, and I grew up and studied in Argentina. Then I moved to France because I wanted to study something that was not available uh, in my country. And now, because because life happens, I work and I live in Sweden, where I am an assistant professor, which basically means that I do both research and teaching in a university. And my original background is in systems engineering, but I was always, uh, since I was a child, I was always fascinated by psychology, both social and experimental, and in general by humans. So when I had the chance, I, I specialized in human-computer interaction. And I don't think you can get a unified uh, definition of the field that can get everybody happy. But for today, let's say that it's a super multidisciplinary field that studies information technology, but especially the interaction between people and technology. And here, the, the important part to me is that we don't do research or innovation in a vacuum or from an objective point of view. We all have our standing points. Sophia was also mentioned in standing point theories, and, and we all have our ways of seeing and being in the world and our ways of knowing about the world. So in my case, uh, I'm an intersectional feminist, so this influences a lot the research topics that I choose, the methods that I use, how I cite the work of others, who I choose to cite, how and with whom I collaborate, and so on. And uh, in recent years, to give you an example, I have been working on digital women's health, doing feminist research on life life transitions and specifically framing them as natural, normal parts of life and resisting their medicalization as a way of resisting patriarchy and ultimately as a way of fighting for social justice in the everyday life, which is one of my, my goals in, in my research. So what is my link to AI? Well, on the one hand, I am interested uh, in a recent trend in my field of using AI as a design material and as an element in interaction design. And on the other hand, I'm interested in the role that designers or interaction designers can play in the design process of systems that actually use AI techniques. Because I, I really think that the future of design will have and already has a lot of AI, but I really, really hope that this is not a future where human decisions get fully automated by default, and also that it's not a future where human jobs get massively replaced in the name of progress. So I'm convinced that interaction designers, both in research and in industry, in the private sector, should be mediating uh, or even translating between, for example, data scientists and end users, which is something that sometimes is a bit forgotten about. And uh, my approach to AI is anti-solutionist, and this means that I am against posing AI or technology in general as a solution to societal problems, or let's say more broadly to human problems. So instead, I strive for a use of AI that can help humans in supporting social justice. And here the key is that to me, it's humans who do the social justice, not the technology. The, the AI in this case, can be uh, just a tool or a, at most a collaborator, but not a solution. So I think that researchers uh, using or developing any type of applied AI, they have a role to play in this landscape because I believe that it's very dangerous that development uh, of AI is driven by, controlled by, and limited to only big tech companies. Um, then if we take a more specific uh, view about the field of AI, I think that one evident path for a researcher with my sort of values would be to address bias. And I do think that bias is super interesting, identifying it, showing it, and also intervening it. But I'm also concerned about power, about analyzing and questioning power and power imbalances that happen within uh, data science and AI, because otherwise I think we would be attacking rather the consequences and not necessarily the causes of injustices. And I'm, of course, 
and clearly not uh, the first person taking this perspective, nor the only one. And there is a growing community, both in my field, that is called HCI, and more generally in AI, that we could say that they are aligned uh, with this. But what may help us characterize my approach is that uh, I am highly influenced by the work that is done here in Sweden in my research group that specializes in something called SOMA design. Um, and this is an approach to the design of interactive artifacts that rejects the separation between body and mind. And in doing so, it reclaims the importance of the body that, as many of you can guess, resonates a lot with feminisms. And um, in doing so, uh, also seeks to design interactions that engage in deeper ways with the senses, the five senses and the materiality of humans and the human body with the ultimate goal of living a good life. And this sometimes implies challenging certain concepts that we take uh, in this century for granted, such as productivity or efficiency. So um, the idea is to instead allow oneself both as a designer and as a user to, for example, slow down and to take things in. And this is radically different uh, from mainstream approaches to AI in which uh, the body is just ignored or left behind or uh, approaches that conceptualize uh, an artificial intelligence as only needing a mind to be intelligent and not needing a body at all, or seeing the AI as only cognition and not emotion at all. So more generally put, we could say that SOMA design differentiates from approaches that take these and other categories as dichotomies or as binaries, and it recognizes instead the messiness of human experiences, which actually, if you think about it, also clashes with concepts totally taken for granted in data science, like the concept of data cleaning. Um, so this was... Uh, super long in introduction to what I actually do. So as a feminist researcher, I pose a lot of questions that I often cannot answer on my own, but I try to invite others to think together. So for example, I wonder how can we design, implement, and deploy responsible and ethical AI-based technology or interventions that, as I was saying before, help humans in supporting social justice, and that along this whole process, uh, engage with and revalue the SOMA, and with the SOMA, I mean this unity of body and mind. That also includes uh, the social aspect um, of the SOMA and its relationships, including labor relationships and so on. So this can sound very high level and abstract for some of you that maybe are not in this uh, field of research. So I wanted to just mention briefly some examples of uh, very recent projects that I'm currently involved in. So we haven't published much um, on this yet, but we are doing uh, about to do so. So one is on the topic of reproductive rights. So recently I was studying the user experience of digital contraception because there are people who use algorithms as a contraceptive method. And here's besides looking at how people interact with the AI that there is in the product, I've been also using AI as a tool that leverages on quantitative methods to scale up qualitative methods. And in this approach, the important part to me is that the AI doesn't replace the analytical take of the researcher or the subjectivity of the researcher. So in other words, it doesn't replace the researcher's intelligence, but it collaborates with them. Um, then I think I will shorten this. Uh, I, I had some details about other projects related to designing with people with disabilities. There's one concept that tries to, to leverage on the concept of interdependence between people um, and not seeing the disability as something to fix. And it's uh, about a non-solutionist use of computer vision. We can talk about later uh, about that. And there's another project also on supporting the um, uh, grassroots movements around health activism, basically seeing at how activists and especially disabled activists or people with disabilities who are also activists, how they use both big data and small data uh, for their well-being and for uh, their campaigns. And then the last one I wanted to mention is the project with the NGO Data Genero that is called Aimurai in the context of gender-based violence and justice in Latin America. So the goal of this project is to help law experts that work in the courts uh, to build and maintain a database of cases of gender-based violence in order to ultimately influence policymaking and of course contribute to understanding how this violence develops at the structural level and not at the case-by-case -case level. So it, in this sense, it is non-solution is because the AI will not be trying to solve gender-based violence. We don't think that's possible. And 
uh, even if it, <laughs> if it were, we shouldn't try to do it because the risk of harm would be way more than the benefits. Uh, so instead, I would I this tool that I that I mentioned will be uh, for users uh, who are experts in the legal realm to actually take steps towards a more um, global or broader uh, feminist reform of justice. So I will I will stop here. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Mai. Uh, I love your presentation too. Everything is so interesting. I want to hear. <laughs> I'm really excited. Sorry, I'm really happy uh, that you're all here. Um, and I will uh, pass to the next part of this workshop. We have half an hour. It's not long, I know, and uh, it's, it will be short, but we will think of other ways to stay in touch. Uh, I will share my screen now. Uh, I will be looking this way because I have two screens, just uh, so to let you know, but this one is bigger and for me it's easier. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So uh, this uh, workshop part uh, is going to have a lot of random elements. Uh, and first of all, I will uh, let Zoom to assign us randomly to different rooms. So I don't know which one is going to get which one. But uh, in one room, Sofia and I will be conducting the workshop, and then the other one, Mai and Umut will be uh, conducting the other part, the other group. We will draw some cards from this oracle for trans feminist futures, and uh, after drawing these uh, cards, we will uh, discuss about them. We will have a card of values and a card of situations. So. I don't know if you know this uh, deck of cards, but it's beautiful. Uh, and I have two randomizers here, one until uh, 22 and the other one until 13. So we will draw two cards for each group. So uh, group number one, I will tell you which one is, is which, will get, oh, this is 22, the card number four and the card number 19. So let's see. This is number four. I will put it here and I will send you the, the link to this, don't worry. And the number, no? yes. Okay, this one I will take. And then we will have the interface for me 13, 12, and 11. Maybe your audio is cutting it tiny bit, maybe you can close an app or something. I don't have anything else open. I'm so sorry. Um, I, uh, I will try to do this without, okay, I will close everything. Can you hear me okay now? No? Perfect. Yes. So yes, if yes, I stay yes. really quiet in my computer, it's <laughs> so, uh, this randomizer is not liking it. And these two cards are the ones that I'm going to use. Okay. Uh, 11 and 12. Uh, can you uh, copy past them, Mai, in the space for this group? Here, 11 and 12. In group two? Uh, in this one, in, in the three, because I it's the one I have really, really close. And then we will have two my other numbers, eight and 16. And I will show you what is coming up. Here. And for the other round, the numbers three and one. Perfect. You want me to copy them? Yeah, thank you. So um, I, this was going to be originally in three groups, but since we are 34 now, it's going to be okay to be in two groups. Um, group number one will be the one with the penguin. <laughs> And group number two will be the one with the flower. So when we divide 
the this I, I will show you the this mirror we can go to the rooms and talk about the cards that we have drawn from the deck and what ex, what is a uh, crossing a uh, what are we thinking about these cards and what is uh, important from our practices with these cards? So uh, you will read them in your groups and I will send you the link to the mirror. You can ask for permission to get inside. And I will, I, I know that the time when we do breakout rooms, uh, people leave, but don't leave <laughs> and stay to talk with us. Uh, Okay, from one perfect my selfie and Umut is going to be in here. Perfect. Uh, I will make you, I can't make you co-host my, but uh, it's okay. You will be in room one with Umut and Sofia and I will be in room two. I'm opening all rooms so you can up in the room that you were assigned and see you there.
Okay. We were like removed from the groups, sorry, but the time is coming to an end. And I really appreciate everyone that, st that stayed for this particular moment. Uh, it was really great to hear what you were thinking about these issues. I hope that the deck uh, of the Transfeminist Technologies helped. I will send the link to it so everyone has access to the deck and also to the Miro. If you want access to edit, please ask for it. Ask for it. Um, I think there were a lot of discussions. I don't know if someone from the first group, uh, from Mai and Umut, want to share what they were thinking and discussing uh, like in two minutes. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind to just quickly, um, yeah. kia ora everybody, I'm Sarah from New Zealand, but um, we were talking about children and in AI and um, essentially I think we're all in agreement that children and teenagers especially uh, are needing to be brought into from co-design right through to deployment as a voice. There were issues raised and concerns about how would we protect them in that, in that environment. Um, how realistic is that actually going to happen when we're still trying to involve and include adults? Um, so it's a really rich conversation, but it certainly does highlight um, how important it is for children to be involved as the, our future um, innovators, regulators, scientists. So, um, yeah, I think if anyone else wanted to say if I've missed out. Thank you, Sarah, for the short uh, and condensed analysis of what you were talking about. Uh, we got the card of embodiment. I don't know if, uh, Diana, for example, if you want to talk a little bit about what we discussed. Sorry for putting your name out there, but we know each other. <laughs> so we have a little bit of, uh, like, sisterhood. No worries, Diana. <laughs> yes, uh, we talked about the, um, about the importance of considering uh, other communities and their perspective about technologies. Also, taking account that technologies uh, is not always um, digital technologies. So it's important to to take in account how these communities are thinking about technologies and how um, they are or they have relationship with their development per, per perspective. Uh, we talk also about the relationship about technologies and bodies, also considering um, just the, the, that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and data um, is created um, based on our, our bodies and also our, our physical environments uh, because it's important to consider that um, in, in, in this context, we, we have to, to also um, identify the resources, physical resources and environment resources, resources that are involved in all the technology sustainable. So yes, more or less, there are the main ideas. I don't know if one of you want to share other other ones yeah thank you uh, as uh, Courtney was saying in the chat uh, I would love to continue this conversation and I think that many of us need to so uh, if you uh, can write to me an email uh, here if anyone is interested in continuing this conversation we can discuss via email what is the best way to keep in touch and to keep building together. Um, I will save the chat. You have in this link the the presentation, Feminist AI Workshop, like the, uh, the, the direction book for all of us. So uh, we this is this was like this uh, kickoff of this uh, group, but I think that we can stay in touch and keep building knowledge together from different parts of the world, from the global north and the south. Um, so uh, thank you for the participation and technical moderator is telling me that we should wrap up.
But thank you, Sofia, Mai, Umut, and everyone that stayed until the end. And uh, we will continue this conversation. Thank you.